Hello, I'm Tom Tomich, Professor and Director of the Agricultural Sustainability Institute at UC Davis, and today I'm going to be sharing some thoughts on the field of agroecology, specifically agroecology viewed from the perspective of global change science. This appeared in the Annual Review of Environment and Resources in Volume 36, and I understand from the editorial staff that we set a record for a number of co-authors. I had 15 of my colleagues from UC Davis who participated in this review. As you might guess, the disciplines of soil science, nematology, entomology, plant science, animal science, plant pathology were all represented. But I think it's also noteworthy we had economists, geographers, political scientists, also biogeochemists and genomics specialists. And I'll come back to the significance of those perspectives in the next few minutes. But you might think, hearing all of those disciplines, you know, why do all this heavy lifting? Why make so, life so complicated to have 16 people participating in a review? The short answer to that is in the last 20 years in particular, evidence has been mounting about the global footprint of agriculture. The 40 years from 1960 to 2000 were actually a very good period, perhaps even a golden age for agricultural productivity. Food production on the planet doubled between 1960 and 2000. But what is less known is during that same time, nitrogen use in agriculture doubled and phosphorus tripled. So now synthetic nitrogen fertilizer surpasses natural nitrogen in global ecosystems. So agriculture is well understood in terms of its social footprint, land footprint, water footprint, but these global biogeochemical cycles and the dominance of agricultural activities are relatively new. Now, that was 20th century. Let's look ahead to the 21st century. We have a couple of relative certainties. Human population on the planet is going to surpass 9 billion by about 2050. Probably will continue growing through 10 billion compared to about 7 billion today. It also seems a safe bet, but also a very big concern that we'll be facing increasing scarcity of fresh water resources. But on top of that, there are many big uncertainties that compound those relative certainties. One is climate change and the effect it has on agriculture, both in terms of yields, but also water supply and invasive pests and diseases. But on top of that, and not unrelated, is uncertainty about energy prices and the price of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, not to mention kinds of economic and political realignments that we're seeing. When this review was done, no one anticipated the Arab Spring, for example, particularly not its timing. So agriculture and food production face multiple stressors. This includes climate change, but isn't restricted to climate change. Contemporary agriculture also itself contributes significantly to these stressors. So in my view, one of the central challenges of the 21st century is how are we going to provide the food for those 9 billion people by 2050? That's a big enough challenge in and of itself. I'm optimistic we can do it. But the additional question is how to produce that food in ways that maintain the social and ecological integrity of the planet's systems. In other words, how do we produce that much food without undermining the resource base that future generations beyond 2050 are going to depend on? So let me focus more on agroecology within this global change context. Agroecology can be viewed as a movement, and many of our colleagues, particularly working in Latin America, now view agroecology as a, as a vehicle for social change and social justice. And I recognize that the validity and importance of those efforts. Another protect, uh, perspective on agroecology is as a set of particular agricultural practices. And finally, the focus of the talk today is agroecology as a scientific discipline that spans ecological, economic, and social dimensions of agriculture. It's not to deny the importance of any of those three, but for the annual reviews, our focus was on that third part of agroecology as a scientific discipline. In other words, thinking of agriculture and the study of agriculture as a coupled social and ecological system. Now this raises some interdisciplinary imperatives. One, which goes back to the roots of agroecology 30 or more years ago as a scientific field, is bridging the boundary between agricultural sciences and environmental sciences. And much of the exploding literature in agroecology deals 
with that particular boundary. But the other is the bridge between agricultural sciences and the social sciences, including economics. And on a planet in which our species, human beings, are increasingly the dominant force for change, I think it should be clear that the social sciences, human behavior, human institutions, incentives, uh, communities, nation states, are all an important part of understanding both the problems, but also potential solutions. Can I do, all, do any justice to this in just a few minutes? No way, but I'm just gonna pick out a few of the salient points that emerged from the review over the next few minutes. One is, and this is well understood within agroecology, the value of agrobiodiversity is very well established in agricultural production systems from a scientific perspective, and we're making progress on management at the, the field and the farm level, big questions remain about how to manage and preserve agrobiodiversity at the landscape and regional and not to mention global scales. But I'll return to this point that going the opposite direction into the micro world of soil biology is probably one of the most fruitful areas for future research. And in the review, we use pollination ecology and nematology and recent advances in those two fields to illustrate these points. Another, and this is looking back to the 20th century, in a cartoonish way, we could characterize the agricultural success of the 20th century in many ways as substituting petroleum and natural gas, so fossil, fossil energy resources for many ecosystem services. I've emphasized nitrogen fertilizer so far. If, if we project ahead in terms of a increase of 70 to 100 percent in food production that we're going to be seeking between now, now and 2050. Can we simply continue as business as usual with our nitrogen fertilizer management? My feeling is the answer is probably no to that, and that comes out in the review also, that the, the business as usual approach would result in unprecedented not, uh, nitrogen loading in the Earth's ecosystems. A related issue has to do with our livestock production systems, which again, over the last generation, have become increasingly decoupled from crop production. And there's really no scientific consensus about sustainable future paths for livestock production as a sustainable entity, a standalone system in and of itself. This raises questions, but also huge challenges in practice, but also research about reintegration of cropping and livestock. Now let me shift to some of the questions that we raised regarding the future agenda for agroecology research. One is a particularly difficult one for those of us in the sciences, which is about the normative challenges. How can agroecology as a science approach different values and ethical systems? What I mean by this is not identifying the uniquely most sustainable set of values, but actually science addressing explicitly different value systems that may be in conflict. And many of the controversies around animal welfare, genetically modified organisms in the food system, and I could go on and on, actually I think will, re will require resolution of some of those conflicts over values. And as scientists, we need to engage with people who can help us to make those connections. Another agenda item for the future is what is the role of integrated systems in our adaptation to global change in a more resilient food system? Integrated cropping systems, call them permaculture, call them agroforestry, call them mixed livestock and cropping systems, have been around for a long time, since the beginning of agriculture. They have been understudied, though, in terms of their potential for improved nitrogen management, um, and also better livelihoods, food security for, for local communities. Shifting into the below ground sphere, one of the other areas that we think is very high priority uh, and that could have huge payoffs over the course of a generation is better understanding of how we can actively manage below ground biodiversity. Organisms in the soil regulate many of these key processes, whether it's uh, methane and nitrous oxide uh, flows, water, uh, soil carbon, all of those things are in some sense shaped by soil biodiversity. The explosion of genomics tools, metagenomics, opens up possibilities 
for great breakthroughs there that can have practical significance. Finally, one of the things that's most surprising about our current state of knowledge is we're very weak on indicators and frameworks for anticipating thresholds and, and abrupt changes. Where are we close to going over the edge and where do we have some leeway? Phrased another way, where are we approaching planetary boundaries regarding the footprint of the food system? We need to invest in monitoring and in ways of understanding those discontinuities. So in closing, I hope that you'll have a look at the review. I hope you'll appreciate our efforts to conceptualize agroecology within the context of global change. And also, I think you'll share our conclusion that the approach to agriculture as the coupled system par excellence is fruitful. But I want to emphasize, it's not necessary that all studies be comprehensively integrated in this way. And in fact, very few, if any of the studies that we reviewed out of the 200 or so um, citations that we looked at actually take that approach. And I'd just like to say that there's tremendous value in pairwise integration across disciplines, agriculture and environment, agriculture and social science. And I just want to emphasize that importance of problem solving and advancing our agroecological knowledge, that addressing problems in specific places for specific people, those are all great ways to achieve interdisciplinary integration. Thank you very much.